Welcome everyone, and thank you for joining today's webinar, How to Budget Agile Drupal Projects, a Marketer's Guide. Before we begin, I wanted to quickly go over a couple of housekeeping items for today's webinar. First, I want to encourage everyone to use the Ask a Question section for any questions that come up during the webinar. We'll cover questions at the end of the presentation. Second, we typically get asked whether the webinar recording will be available. The answer is yes. This presentation will be recorded and can be accessed on our Media Current channel in BrightTalk. A little about Media Current, um, we're an open source expansion partner. We're known for Pioneer Than Playbook on Drupal and we're here to support our client partners and community with deep open source strategies and guidance on the road to Drupal and successful website projects. Hi everyone, I'm Paul Chasen. I'm a managing partner at Media Current. And one of the most gratifying aspects of being a part of Media Current for me is collaborating with our team members and clients to solve really big problems. Um, just to give you an idea of my background, I'm a creative, I have a design background, and I uh, also have a programming background, so I'm kind of one of those rare breeds. I've got experience with virtually every aspect of a website project, including estimation, designing, and developing websites. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Josh Leinert, uh, coming to you today from Atlanta, Georgia. I've been working in website design and development since about 1999. Been working with Paul since about 2007, so time really flies when you're having fun. What inspires me is open source and how you're not limited when using it, so your solutions are only as limited as to what you can dream and build. What we're gonna be covering today are a lot of great best practices from organizations you're seeing on your screen, like Penn State, NASDAQ, Principal Financial Group, and PricewaterhouseCoopers, the world's largest professional services organization. So excited to be with you today. The material that we're covering is available for download in our Agile Drupal Projects budgeting kit but don't use that download as an excuse to hop off the webinar. We're gonna be covering a lot of really good tips that are gonna be able to allow you to act on the resources in the kit. So don't touch that dial. Our agenda is pretty straightforward. We're gonna to try to keep the presentation to 30 to 40 minutes and then leave plenty of time for Q&A. We're gonna start by framing what a successful Agile website project looks like. Uh, and then we're gonna go step-by-step step through the six steps of the Agile budgeting process and conclude with Q&A. We're looking forward to collaborating with you after the presentation. So let's start with what a successful Agile web project looks like. And to do that, we're gonna start by defining Agile. I really like this graph on the screen that you're gonna see in a moment. Agile is essentially taking a very large, complex initiative and breaking it down into small sections of work to deliver more value and progress regularly. So for a marketer, this graphic's probably looking a little like uh, what a project manager would own but it's really your responsibility to ensure that these sprints are going well and you're providing leadership along the way. So when it comes to an agile project, you're probably involved in a couple of the steps that you see on the screen here. But if you follow these steps uh, effectively, you can add more velocity, which gets your initiatives to markets faster, which I know as a marketer is important to you. But with great power comes great responsibility. So that's what we're here to help with because what we want to try to avoid is this next graphic you're gonna see on the screen. That is a project going off the rails. In this case, way off the rails. 
uh, off the rails. A few of those. <laughs> yeah, no doubt. Um, this could mean way over budget. This could mean one of those uh, never ending slipping timelines that becomes September 1st, October 1st, November 1st. I'm sure we've all been a part of those. So this is what we're trying not to do. But let's look at what we do want to accomplish. What success looks like uh, in Agile is making sure deliverables are clearly understood by all parties, timelines are predictable, and the appropriate value is being delivered in relation to the money spent. A couple of years ago, there was a very well-known car rental company in the middle of a lawsuit because they spent $32 million on a website redesign project that never took shape, that never saw the light of day. And that happens more than you know. Uh, in addition, stakeholders need to understand what features are most and least important. Communication should be very collaborative, should be very frequent. And then lastly, on the bottom right of the screen, retrospectives should be done after each sprint to capture feedback and improvements. That's important to make sure you continue to do the right things over and over again and you avoid doing the wrong things. And in addition, it actually builds a lot of great rapport on your project team. So retrospectives uh, are a very, very effective tool. So examples of agile projects. We're working with an organization right now on a Drupal migration project that has a nine month time frame and over 650 hours a month being allocated across that nine month time frame. That's a lot of team members, that's a lot of moving pieces and parts. We work with other organizations who have already been through the migration process, who may have already redesigned their website, and now they're optimizing and supporting it year over year. In those cases, they typically have a budget of that's set at the beginning of the year, and it's up to us as partners to help maximize that budget over the course of 12 months. Still working in an agile fashion, only more with an always on mentality. And lastly, innovation. You may be adopting a new technology to replace a legacy system that you haven't used previously, and your team may not know how to use it, may not know all the ins and outs. That's gonna have a higher level of risk and budget uncertainty. And while there may be new technology in place, some of your business rules um, for your legacy systems need to stay in place as well, and the intersection of those can become quite complicated. So let's look at the six steps of the budgeting process that you should be going through with each project. First, identifying your requirements. Second, making sure you have the right stakeholder buy-in. Third, understanding and having a shared minimum viable product vision. Fourth, defining the budget, which is here, which is why we're here today to help you navigate that. And then finding the right partner if you need outside help. And then lastly, as I mentioned earlier, tracking your spending. So we're gonna go through each one of these steps in more detail, but before that, Paul, I wanted to kick it back over to you to maybe talk about some of the challenges that these um, participants might run into before we run through that process. Yeah, thanks, Josh. Um, the, the, the thing that I like about the examples that you showed is that really an Agile project can come in all shapes and sizes. So you, you've got this, um, this concept of a project which can really kind of take any shape or form and there's a process though that we can apply that's standard and really doesn't deviate that much to any, to any shape, you know, size project. Um, with that process though, you have to keep in mind that there are gonna be some challenges that come up because the greatest benefit that you get from using the Agile process is flexibility. That's the ability to not know necessarily what's gonna happen 
uh, in the middle of the project or have unknowns come up and Agile, the Agile framework allows you to address those in, in, a, very, um, in a very effective way. Let's talk about what some of those challenges are. Maybe there's not one person that you're working with in uh, your department who's, who's participated in an Agile project. Um, you know, we've seen organizations that only know or only have experienced traditional waterfall project management, and they may not have that expertise in-house. Uh, another challenge that we see is nobody has time to, to participate in the budgeting process, much less in the actual project. Uh, another challenge is you know, the tools and infrastructure aren't in place for Agile. And um, generally speaking, you need a continuous integration environment and a ticketing system. Another challenge that comes up sometimes, and it seems so simple to solve, but it actually creates a lot of complexity in Agile projects, is um, access to MarTech systems. If there's uh, a CRM or, or an ERP that needs to be integrated and simply not having login permission to those systems can, can really create a lot of time and cost overruns on an Agile project. When you're starting the process, though, of putting together an Agile budget, the first thing you want to do is identify business requirements and the requirements of how the site needs to function, essentially. But those requirements should follow goals and KPIs. It's kind of the idea of form follows function. These goals and KPIs, they need to be documented and measurable. And ideally, every goal should tie back to a dollar value. Now, when you're going through this process of documenting, you want to capture that functionality in what are called epics. If you're not familiar, an epic is a short statement describing how a problem can be solved or how a goal can be met on your uh, website. And we'll cover what that looks like um, in a few minutes. Also, I mentioned MarTech stack just uh, on the previous slide. You'll want to review your current MarTech stack when you're uh, putting together requirements because you may have features and functionality that exist in systems that you're already using and paying for but you're not aware of that feature existing. Don't reinvent the wheel if you can tap into that functionality without paying for it again. Also, don't assume that your implementation partner, the team that's going to be actually executing the project, will just simply know what you want. That's why it's hugely important to define those goals and features up front. And one really, really important step Josh touched on earlier is prioritization force ranking features. You want to ask yourself throughout the process, throughout each stage of the process, what features and functionality are most important? Which have the most to least business value? If you don't do that, really no priority equates, into dis, equates to disorganization. Let's talk about writing epics. What you'll want to do is assign what's called a product owner. Maybe that's you. The product owner should be someone who has enough time and knowledge to dedicate to the overall project and the process of pulling together epics and writing user stories. And just as a side note, senior leaders like VPs or executive, executive levels, they're often not really the best suited for that role because their calendars are typically full already. And when you're, you want to make sure... Sorry, Go ahead, Josh. Yeah, I wanted to interject just one thing because in my role at Media Current, I respond to a lot of RFPs. And many of you on the call today probably are involved with and or write RFPs. Try to think about what Paul's referring to here in the context of writing an RFP. And I challenge you to go back and look at the RFPs that you've been involved with. My guess is that you're going to have bullet points in that RFP that speak to um, goals, not necessarily defined requirements. So we'll get an RFP that says, okay, we want a new website that has a better look and is easy to use. Well, that's not clear enough for someone to understand what the goal is going to be. So writing good epics breaks those top level objectives down into actionable um, uh, chunks that someone can actually start building solutions around. 
Yeah, that's a great point. Thanks for bringing that up, Josh. The product owner, you know, is uh, who will likely be you, is in the process of writing epics, and and as you're going through that process, make sure that you're not duplicating um, epics across different features and functionality. Um, we see that oftentimes in really big projects, and um, it can be confusing when you're going to stakeholders and, and getting buy-in, and we'll talk about that in a moment. So you want to make sure that all epics contain at least one action verb in the title, and that that action, like Josh said, focuses on what needs to be accomplished. Um, you know, the, I'll give you an example, the bad epic, the third bad epic on the left, make sure the secure messaging interface has a new widget. That really doesn't give uh, the reader a sense of what needs to be accomplished. If you look at the, at the good epic in relation to the bad one, building a secure messaging interface, it's simple and it's concise and it defines a goal. One thing to keep in mind as you're going through the process of gathering requirements and writing epics is don't fall into the over-engineering trap. Keep it simple. You'll want to start thinking about the roles and the skills that are needed for the project. And at a minimum, you'll need a UX designer, front-end developer, back-end developer, a QA analyst, and a project manager. And these roles are all included by default in the Agile budgeting kit. It, it'll, as you go through this process, it'll be tempting to add more roles um, the more complex the project is, but you want to be aware of the, there's this concept called the mythical man month, which kind of um, the idea is more manpower doesn't translate into faster velocity. And a guy by the name of Fred Brooks, uh, he's a software engineer, he wrote a book in the 70s where he found that increasing the number of people on a software project actually has an inverse effect on productivity because those people have to communicate more, and that communication is actually a burden on the velocity of the project. So you'll want to keep in mind just mitigating scope creep and complexity. It'll be an underlying challenge throughout the estimation and budgeting process and also during the project itself. You want to focus on elegance, not so much on feature richness. Another aspect to think about is the launch date and timing. So, you know, ask yourself, is there an event that's influencing the project launch date? Um, keep in mind that the longer the timeline or having an open-ended timeline, it's going to translate into a higher cost for that MVP. Open or, or long timelines, they actually create a longer time gap for getting and analyzing the site's valuable user behavior data. So it is essential to put a timeline on the calendar and try and stick to it. It also helps you force rank what you want to get done when it comes to uh, building out uh, requirements during the project. And don't forget at this point to start thinking about the, po the post-launch roadmap. It, the roadmap, it doesn't have to be too detailed. You want to earmark some of the budget for at least six months of post-launch sprints if your budgets are approved annually. It'll put you in a much better position to reap the project's maximum value over time if you start addressing post-launch early on in the budgeting process. I'm going to hand it back over to Josh to talk about stakeholder buy-in. Yeah, this is one of my favorite topics uh, because it's centered around requesting financial support, requesting team support to accomplish a critical objective. And I think back to the early days of my uh, senior leadership career where I got a really slick demo from a software company. I was just really wowed by all the things the software could do to help me and my team in their day-to-day -day role. Uh, felt like it was a reasonable spend, so I took it into uh, the partner's um, office to, to get approval for it, showed them the slick demo. There was a lot of head nodding, and I thought things were on the right track. And 
Then I started to get a bunch of questions that I wasn't at all prepared for that I needed to be prepared for. One of those was, great, what's the first step after we buy this? How are we going to deploy it? How are we going to adopt it? Does HR need to be involved? Does IT need to be involved? And I didn't have the answers to those. So by no means was I ready to get approval for this project. And that was a relatively small spend. Think about that at a larger scale for a website redesign project that's gonna be hundreds of thousands of dollars. So keep that in mind as we go through the next couple of slides. So to my point earlier, the first thing you need to do is who's coming along with you on this journey? What uh, departments are gonna be impacted? What specific roles do you need to have to support you and the project? And what steps are needed to gain approval uh, at every step? Not only for approval of the project, but approval of the work as you go through the project. So identifying who those people are first, getting them involved early is critical. And then you want to avoid surprises. Uh, these are very common things that we see across the 20 plus projects we do each year. We find that just when stakeholders are needed for critical participation and approval, they're not available. It could be around a board meeting. It could be around the holidays. There's a lot of you out there guilty of setting uh, January 1st law states. Um, the other thing is, is feedback and approval on the epics that were written. You know, they were, they were produced as part of that first step, but gaining uh, the stakeholder buy-in for those epics across the people in which the project impacts is a great thing to do to get that extra layer of validation. Yeah, Josh, the, the, yeah. the last thing that any of us wants is, you know, the, the person in the department that you rarely interact with, but you are building out a section on your site for them, they come in in the last week of the project and tell you that you have it all wrong and you need to rebuild their section of the site. I think like we've seen that happen so many times in, in the years that we've been doing this. And, and so we try and coach uh, the people, the clients that we work with to get buy-in early. Yeah, that's a great point. It may seem easier out of the gate to approach these individuals later, or you don't want to interrupt what they're working on, but they'll appreciate having the heads up that this is happening. And once their voice is heard, it makes uh, acceptance and adoption of the new plan and platform a lot easier. So yeah, Paul, sounds like you're speaking from experience there. And then, the, you know, I think the common language that um, you want to use as you're going through these meetings and discussions is one of numbers because numbers don't lie and they transcend any and all discipline and departments in the organization. So ROI analysis, when you're trying to gain stakeholder buy-in is a really, really important um, document and presentation to have as you're going through it. And it could be as easy as a spreadsheet. Um, you know, you'd be surprised how many individuals and organizations fail to put together a spreadsheet of you know what their kpis are on the project maybe it's a kpi around uh increasing revenue maybe it's a kpi around reducing costs maybe it's a kpi around you know freeing up someone's time to do more strategic work so the next slide is an example of what that um, KPI definition scorecard could look like. And this is included in our kit. On the first column, you'll see it's the current measurement. That's the benchmark. What's the current state? In this example, we're showing university client. Halfway down the screen, you'll see qualified student applications. That's what a lot of universities are going after. But there's other activities like organic search traffic, uh, email campaigns to keep prospective students engaged, uh, conversion metrics like bounce rate, 
uh, to facilitate those applications and also alumni donations. So you should have the current measurement in place, a uh, schedule for when you're reviewing those, and then marking some stakes in the ground for when you're gonna measure those after your project's live. And state a goal. Um, in organic search traffic, you're gonna increase at 25%. Um, that's gonna lead to you know, more cost savings per year. Whatever the metrics are that you're working through, it's important to have this scorecard. So I challenge you today to utilize the kit that we're providing and see if you can benchmark some of your key KPIs, put a percent growth on them that you feel is reasonable and attainable, and then use that to help drive the underlying top line or bottom line number to help support the ask in the investment that you're making. So if you invest $200,000, but it returns $400,000 uh, after the project, that's a very good thing. And again, it'll really help facilitate approval of the project. There's two other tools in addition to showing the math that are really the big guns when it comes to uh, speaking the language of senior leadership. The first is a risk register. That's included in the kit and it basically logs the big risks of a project. So let's say you're adopting a new marketing automation platform that's gonna plug into your website. What are the risks? Well, one, does someone know how to use the new tool? Two, does someone know how to integrate the new tool with the website? Well, if that's not done correctly, what's the cost? Well, if your email campaigns aren't running, there's a big cost there. So the risk register allows you to quantify that. And what it's telling your stakeholders is this individual understands where the hazards are, where the potholes are, and knows how to get around them. Uh, uh, Josh, I, lo I love this document because you know, if you're like a CFO or a CEO, you're always thinking, what's, what's my risk going to be? Well, like, why, why is this investment going to be valuable for my organization? And that risk register really kind of helps, you know, identify, it helps put that, that, that risk sentiment on paper, which is huge when it comes to trying to sell an idea to an executive level team member. Yeah, and it just made me think of something else, Paul, is we've used the risk register to document the opportunity cost as well, which is, all right, say the project doesn't get approved. Well, here's the risk in us not conducting and moving forward on the project. And that's, yeah, that's been a great point. Yep. And then um, a business case document, think of it as an internal proposal. You know, it's most effective when you have something you can circulate in advance of a, of a discussion for stakeholders to read and review. And then when you're coming to the table in a live meeting, you can use that to really narrow in on decision points and less about trying to present everything from scratch. So that's another uh, template that's available in our kit. It has a lot of uh, sections in it to help guide what you know, makes up a, a great business case for your potential website project. And then, um, you know, there's, a, there's an old saying, a camel's a horse designed by committee. Um, it basically means, you know, less is more. Uh, it's important to have everyone involved, as we mentioned. When it comes to your core project team, keep that relatively small and make sure they're more engaged constantly. Um, you can't skip meetings uh, when, you're, when you're working agile. And the more stakeholders you try to bring into those meetings, the harder that's gonna to be to, to do. So make sure you're uh, building a rather small, engaged project team. And then for the larger group, for everyone that needs to be involved, that is something you can do more on a quarterly basis to keep everyone informed. Thanks, Josh. After you've gone through the process of gaining that stakeholder buy-in, you've had meetings, you've gotten a, a, a pretty good idea of where your features and epics need to rank in terms of priority, 
now you're at the step where you want to really define what that MVP or minimum viable product is. And just as a reminder, that minimum viable product, it should include the must-have features that you need your site to launch with. When you think about MVP vision, you'll want to capture the, those features that are described in epics uh, and break them you, you'll want to capture them in what are called user stories, and uh, we've referenced those uh, earlier. Um, we'll, go, we'll talk about what user stories look like in a moment, but before we get into that, double, again, at this stage, you'll want to double check that prioritization. Make sure that there isn't any reordering that's needed after you've concluded all of your stakeholder meetings. And just keep in mind that the more features, the more budget is going to be required. I can't emphasize this reprioritization review enough. Absolutely needs to happen at this point in the process. To give you an idea on in Agile in terms of timeline, the standard duration of an Agile sprint is two weeks. And, and your goal is going to be to incrementally build the project over the course of several or many two-week intervals. Our budget tool that's inside the budgeting kit has default guidelines for how to assess estimating these user stories. And those guidelines are based on level of complexity. All the defaults, as we mentioned earlier, are derived from our agency's history of producing Agile projects. Um, so what you'll want to do is plug in your epics, stories, project roles, and the budget tool will generate your project timeline and estimated cost. As a couple of tips, there's always a tendency during prioritization to push the more complex features to a lower priority, but those features typically require more time and resources to produce. So you want to keep those at a high priority and start on those earlier in the project. And another tip, if there's a really, really complex feature, plan to build a proof of concept or sometimes called a POC so that you don't run the risk of tying up too much of your budget and resources without having a clear, really clear understanding of the probability of that feature viably working. Let's dive into breaking down epics. User stories, they take epics at a, a, a deeper step into greater detail. So uh, you think about a user story as a statement that conveys the who, the why, and the effect of an action that is related to that epic. You'll want to apply the user story framework that's on the bottom of the slide when breaking down epics. And think about it from the standpoint of as a, a type of user or type of persona, I want to do this thing so that this effect will happen. User stories, they tell the requirements uh, you know, from the perspective of different types of users. And it's kind of like writing a book from the standpoint of different characters. So once you've completed the process of breaking down epics into a collection of user stories, you're going to have all the features completely defined for your project. And once that happens, you'll go into the next step of defining a budget. Yep. And, you know, we at Media Current have been working in open source since 2007. Needless to say, we've done our share of estimating projects. You know, open source is so incredibly valuable because you don't have the limits. You have a lower overall uh, cost of ownership. You've got a huge community supporting the application. But with that comes a lot of challenges in putting forth accurate estimations. They're just difficult to do. So the formula that we're showing on the, sc on the screen is some tooling to make sure that you can bring that accuracy to life. So picking up on where Paul left off, start with a high priority requirement. Focus on that specifically. Define a target number based on the value that is assigned to each story in that requirement. And the way you get that value for each story is you tie the roles and the time frame that 
is expected to complete that story and that requirement. What's rotating on the screen are the various tabs that allows you to plug and play these roles, these time frames against stories to produce a budget number for each requirement. Now, this is working opposite to the way many organizations estimate projects. We'll typically look at the uh, high level business objective, think of it as simple, moderate, or complex, throw a wild guess at it, and then the teams focused on trying to deliver to a number that had zero science to it whatsoever. This brings that science to the process to make your budget as accurate as it can be. So that's a critical first step. What are some things that you can kind of look for also along the way? The first is what we call silent budget killers. These are items that if they're included in your requirements and stories, you're going to want to circle as they have a lot of unknowns and in many cases, dependencies on things that you don't directly control. Single sign on is a good example. Uh, if you don't know what that is, we can cover that in Q&A, but there's a lot of sight unseen and dependencies there. So what should you do? Cross your fingers and hope? No, build in some padding. Give yourself a 20% cushion on some of these items so that the money's there if you need it. And then I think, you know, when it comes to other influences on budget, um, you know, we're, we're not accountants, don't claim to be, but working in the large enterprise, we've seen a lot of requests for uh, being flexible around CapEx versus OpEx expenditures. So CapEx has its own set of advantages from an accounting standpoint as well as OpEx, but there's ways where if money needs to be uh, allocated in different ways to approve the project, there's options available to you. So certainly speak to your accountant about that. On the right, we have payment structures and risk. Now, your procurement department may dictate this, but from our experience, uh, it's typically open for negotiation. So I wanted to touch on some of these uh, really briefly. A 50-50 would be some sort of a split between a down payment and then money on completion of the project. Milestone base would mean, you know, every time a partner agency delivers something to you, once it's accepted, you pay. Uh, time and materials is very flexible, uh, pretty self-explanatory. There's a monthly allocation that's not to exceed, that's typically done so that accounting and procurement knows what kind of check they're going to be cutting every month. And then there's the good old fixed fee, which is locking the project to a specific number. Um, there's a lot of different degrees of risk to both parties, you and the organization. So these have to be taken very carefully. Paul, is there anything you wanna add to yeah. this? Yeah, yeah. Uh, so fixed fee usually is the has the high it puts the highest degree of risk on the implementation partner and there's a very low degree of risk on the buyer and and what we've seen you know happen during fixed fee projects is there has to be so much planning done up front to alleviate that risk on the agency that the project just becomes a waterfall project and it completely contradicts the principles of agile in in our experience the the payment schedule that we've seen work best in terms of fairness for both the buyer and the implementation partner is the monthly not to exceed because you know what you're going to be paying per month. Uh, you have some flexibility for unknowns that are going to come up from month to month. And if you've budgeted correctly, if you've gone through the budget process correctly, you've already identified what the launch timeline or launch date is. So you're, you're, it, the, Fairness uh, is pretty equal in that monthly not to exceed approach to payment schedules. Yep. Thanks, Paul. And then some of you are probably out there saying, you know, what if my budget's already defined? And I, I didn't have the chance to go through this process you're showing me because I was just given a number. Well, the good news is you've got a budget to play with. Uh, the bad news is, is you're going to have to push back a little bit. 
you know, because that number was set before you went through this process, you're not going to be able to get everything on your wish list. You're going to have to go through, force rank your features, force rank your functionality, and you need to be really tough internally to let your stakeholders know that not everything is likely to be delivered when a budget's set in advance. But you certainly can deliver something and can think about uh, sort of a, a phase two or a phased approach to do that. And then one thing that can be missed is you know ongoing support after the project's done. That's typically not on the chopping block at first, but we find that you know an investment of 30 to you know 50 percent could be needed to support and optimize the platform after it's live so please keep that in mind as you have your original budget for your project but you'll also need some investment behind that once it's launched to continue to adapt and really leverage the initial investment that you made once you've gone through and i then defined your budget, uh, the next step in the process is finding out who's going to actually do the, do the project or do the work, who's going to execute it. Uh, it's identifying that implementation partner. And there are quite a few pros and cons to think about as you go through, uh, you know, work through finding out or who that partner should be. Partnering with an in-house team, it could be ideal, but you may run the risk of that team not having the full breadth of skills that are required for your project. An offshore partner can be less, a less expensive option, but it usually requires exponentially more management and communication effort. And you know, speaking of offshore, often geography, it doesn't matter much in terms of north to south, but time zone does. And time zone could have an impact on meeting times and stakeholder availability. Like for example, if you uh, if you're more than three time zones away from that implementation partner, it's pretty likely that you or they are going to need to meet outside of the common you know nine to five workday. So you want to just be very careful about weighing these pros and cons uh, when you're evaluating different types of partners. Um, you know, a couple, a couple of tips, uh, rules of thumbs, test and, and, implementation, and implementation partners' capabilities. You can do that through a proof of concept for larger projects. We kind of touched on the POC idea earlier. A smaller fee up front for a POC could offset or you know, serve as the insurance that you'll have in knowing that the partner that you select has the right skills and the right team chemistry. Also, ask the team that you're vetting for documentation that they've created from previous projects. If that documentation is disorganized or maybe there's a complete lack of documentation, that's going to serve kind of as a canary in the coal mine indicating their inability to execute well. As a general rule of thumb, the lower an agency's rate is, the more time it's probably going to take for them to complete a project. Uh, in addition to documentation, review the implementation partner's case studies. You want to look for signs that the partner tracks ROI or that they demonstrate kind of how their work had a positive impact on performance metrics. Ask them how to describe a difficult problem they were challenged with, how they overcome that. Do they have any experience working on projects similar to yours? Also ask how big is the agency or are their employees full-time if it's an outside agency or if it's an inside department, how many full-time folks do they have? Does the size of the team actually correlate to the size of your project? Keep this in mind though when you're evaluating agencies. Typically boutique agencies, they might have a deep experience in a niche or a vertical, um, but they're likely going to have less bandwidth or, and availability because they're just simply smaller. And once you've identified that partner and you've started your project, one really important step, and it's easy to forget, is actually tracking spending. Josh is going to touch on how to do that. Yeah, we're just a few minutes away from Q&A here, so we're looking forward to that. But this is tying back to the examples that I mentioned earlier about projects that um, have you know essentially several hundred hours being invested month to month 
And the uh, example I gave were, you know, one of the larger rental car companies ended up getting stuck with a bill with very little projects, uh, progress rather. This is where this comes into play. So the first thing you do is get your infrastructure in place. And that's having a system like JIRA or other project management application that you can use to document everything. So we talked about epics and user stories at length. They all contain tickets, which would be handed off to a team member to execute on. But those tickets need to have an estimate um, assigned to it. If not, that team member could essentially, in theory, keep working on it forever. So make sure it's tied to a very specific estimate in hours and not open-ended, or that team member has zero to no guidance on how much time they're allowed or should be spending on that project. And then from there, uh, you know, the communication and team collaboration uh, should be steady uh, week to week, uh, scrum meetings, uh, weekly status meetings, uh, internal scrum meetings versus scrumming with uh, your client partner. All those things need to happen. Don't cancel those. And then review the KPIs on a quarterly basis uh, if it's something that you already have live and in the wild to make sure that all the work that you're doing together is really paying off and impacting your, your bottom line. And I think with that, Paul, if you just want to wrap up our key takeaways, we can go into Q&A. Yeah, definitely. Goals and KPIs should be defined first. And those goals and KPIs are gonna inform your requirements. So document your requirements uh, as you go along in drafting those epics and user stories. Don't forget to collaborate with stakeholders to gain approval and un get an understanding of how those requirements should be prioritized. Use the Agile budgeting kit that we've included in the webinar to correlate value with each user story. You'll want to take time to weigh the pros and cons of different types of implement implementation partners and make sure to track your investment during the course of the project uh, all the way through launch. All right, Josh and I have time for questions. If you have a question, you can submit it through Bright Talks Ask a Question section. We do have some questions from our audience, but feel free to keep submitting questions and we'll cover as many as we can in our time left. First question we have is, I'm new to Agile. Do you have any resources or pointers for learning the ins and outs? Josh or Paul, are you able to jump on that one? Yeah, I was um, just reaching for the mute button there. Paul, you were talking about some resources uh, before we jumped on the call this afternoon. I think it'd be good to highlight. Yeah, thanks, Josh. Um, I was having some mute difficulties as well. Uh, problem solved. Yeah, best place to start to get a really high level overview of Agile is on mediacurrent.com in our resources section. We have a, a, a blog article that's that kind of covers the the four or five highlights that are really the gist of how to be successful at Agile. And if you go through that article, there's actually a link at the bottom of the page to the Scrum Alliance. The Scrum Alliance is a certifying body for the Agile project methodology. Um, just simply hit MediaCurrent.com, go to the search box, type in Agile. Um, and you'll find the article. Thank you. Um, so another question, is Agile a responsibility of the project manager or all team members? Yeah, that's a, a great question. Um, likely coming from a project manager that's that's felt the weight of managing Agile for, for more complex projects. The answer is Agile's a responsibility of everyone on the project team, not just the project manager. And it's the responsibility of everyone on the project team on the client side too, in the event it's an agency client relationship. So what does that look like practically? Practically at kickoff meetings, you want to make sure everyone's aligned on the agile process and how it's gonna work. 
You'll want to have um, good documentation for what's included in each sprint and how each of those deliverables will be accepted. And you want to sign off on those prior to each sprint. And if you want to reach out afterwards, we can point you um, in the direction of some good templates to use there and potentially involve that in our Agile um, budgeting kit as well. But that way there's a shared understanding from not just the PMs, but also the entire client and project teams on what's being delivered and the workflow, as well as the time commitment needed from all parties. Great. Uh, another question, what was the inspiration around providing this webinar for the Drupal community? I can, I, I can jump on that one, Josh. We are seeing more and more of the prospects and the organizations that we talk to and our clients as well, wanting to understand how to budget for agile projects. The marketplace we're in now is digitally driven and you know, the concept of not only agile development, but agile marketing is becoming more and more adopted within the circles that we talk in and the organizations that we work with. And we realize from going through this process of helping those organizations gain budget approval for agile projects that it can, it can be a tricky process. And there are some tips and, and best practices that can be applied to the process of getting an agile budget defined successfully. And we wanted to share that with everyone. And then, you know, we also haven't seen a lot of thought leadership in this space. Um, if you think about it, Agile really just kind of came on the scene one day and everyone started slinging the term around and, you know, practicing it without really practicing it. And, you know, we saw a lot of common problems that Agile could solve. Um, it's just a matter of doing it the right way. You know, it originally came on the scene to really help solve common problems around project communication, how work was being delivered and displayed. But it felt like there wasn't one um, path or one swim lane that everyone was sort of following when it really came to light in the marketplace. So we still see a big need for providing leadership in this area, we'll continue to do so and really just wanted to get the conversation started today. Yeah, I see we have another question popped up. How successful have you found working with Milestone for payment fee? Yeah, it, our success with that type of structure it, um, has, has been good, it, it's positive. The, the great thing about it is there's less risk for both parties up front to you know, make a large commitment. The agency or the implementation partner doesn't have to make a large team commitment for months and months if it's a, if it's a really big project, we're talking you know, year long. And the, the buyer doesn't have to do that either. As each milestone progresses, the buyer gets a sense of team chemistry, what the chemistry is like with the implementation partner and vice versa. The really key thing to do in a milestone payment situation, and we touched on this during uh, the presentation, is making sure those milestones are clear and all agreed upon by both the implementation partner and the buyer and those milestones really can't change after those agreements are made because that throws the that can throw the project you know off its um, you know trajectory and it also puts an unfair bias on the implement, implementation partner to have to adhere to a milestone that they weren't planning for uh, when they're when that part of the project started when either that group of sprints or sprint started. Yeah, and I'll add to that. Um, it really kind of goes against Agile in a lot of ways because as Paul mentioned, you're setting the milestones up front. 
The other thing that gets tricky, especially in website projects, is you'll find some overlap. So there's not always really good cutoff points to where you'd have uh, a place you could stop and just invoice for the work being done. So in Agile, you've got the full project teams all working together uh, on shared deliverables, where if you try to go about it by budgeting in advance for milestones, it's really hard to carve it up. And in some cases we've seen, we've had to like roll three different milestones into one payment because there was just too much crossover. And it ended up having a lot of work invoiced towards the end of the project because it was just really difficult to, to segment it out. Okay, I think we have time for one more question. Um, are most marketers moving to using Agile or is it a mix? We're seeing more marketers adopt Agile. Um, and I, I mentioned this earlier because it, it's, it really fits the demands of the digital customer experience marketplace that we're all having to operate in, especially during these different times with uh, COVID-19 and uh, a lot of organizations going to an all remote environment. Great, thank you guys. Um, so that wraps up our question for today's presentation and brings us to the end of the webinar today. Um, but please visit our website, meetacurrent.com for Im information on upcoming webinars. Um, as mentioned, we will provide the recording, um, so be on the lookout for that. We'll send it in via email, and you can also access it on our Bright Talk um, channel. Uh, thanks to our speakers, Paul and Josh, and for everyone who tuned in today. We hope to see you next time, and have a great day. Thank you for your time. Thanks, everyone. Stay safe.